But, uh, of course, thank you all for coming today. Um, as you know, usually Bertie and uh, David Elliott uh, both attend the annual lecture. Um, as many of us will know that, unfortunately, Bertie threw her back out. And I think many of us are at that age that we know what that means, <laughs> that one becomes incapacitated. So I know Bertie is uh, very sad that she's going to be here today. Um, doubly sad because today is her second wedding anniversary and her birthday. Um, and it so happens we had planned an impromptu casual birthday party after dinner. Uh, Bertie, being who she is, wanted to keep this low key so we would have a little cake and things like that. Uh, but it tells you something about the person that, um, that she would want to be with us during her birthday. So uh, that tells you that's, that's Northwestern spirit for you right there. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome Cynthia uh, as uh, representative of the family and also uh, Charles and uh, Everest and Cascade. Uh, the grandkids who uh, Cascade and Everest uh, as grandchildren were with us uh, yesterday and uh, uh, Charles hopefully will be there at dinner. Um, so we're very happy to have at least some members of the uh, Buffett family uh, with us today. Um, I think it's also very clear that, and I think all of us know that uh, the Buffett family has been, uh, Bertie has been a critical supporter of us, that um, uh, it wouldn't be possible to, uh, to work with uh, the undergraduates as we do. And yes, just yesterday dinner we had uh, a meeting with the undergraduates who traveled abroad in the Global Engagement Initiative and had been to places like Bolivia, India, um, Uganda, etc., and have done very, very exciting stuff. And that's only one small piece of the puzzle that we do here. We have graduate student programming, uh, we have faculty exchanges, we have uh, faculty working groups, uh, too many to mention, eight, nine. Um, so in many ways we are the umbrella organization, at least one of the umbrella organizations, at Northwestern that tries to reach out to undergraduates, graduates, and faculty across disciplines and across schools. Uh, so in some sense, we, we hope to be at least one piece of the puzzle of Northwestern as we move towards a, a globalized university, uh, as we're in the midst of strategic planning and thinking through our international exposure, which is uh, multidimensional. We have literally hundreds of programs, um, and we're very happy to be part of that. And we can only be part of that thanks to the contributions that we get from some of our donors like Bertie Buffett, who's been such a great support over the years. So uh, on behalf of Bertie, thank you all for coming, and I'm, I'm very glad that, uh, um, that uh, I can see you again at this annual lecture. I'm also very glad to uh, welcome Bernard Zangel, who's our speaker of today, uh, who's an, a very appropriate speaker, because I can think of no one uh, who can speak more on the topics of globalization and internationalization that uh, keep us uh, busy in so many ways in uh, political science, but also economics. Um, just to give you a quick uh, sense of what uh, Bernard does, uh, by my account, uh, and I pulled this from your German uh, CV, so uh, my German high school is what it is. Um, <laughs> and there's no money back, unfortunately. Um, but uh, among the books that he's published, uh, he's got a book on dispute settlement uh, mechanisms in the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, comparing that to the World Trade Organization. Um, he has several books on the nature of international organizations. Um, he has written a book on the changing role of the state in the world economy. Um, he has also another book out. He is a German, after all. Did I say that? Right. Um, so the, um, the Spitzenklasse uh, is there. Uh, he has written a book on the UN and World Order, and 40 articles and book chapters on a variety of issues dealing with war and peace, but also political economy. So today, Bernard is going to talk about the role of uh, the state compared to uh, the role of the state in international organizations. So uh, I'd like to say, please join me in welcoming Bernard Zangel. And um, we'll give Bernard about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A. All right, Bernard, welcome to Northwestern. Oh, creating a mess here. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for this very friendly introduction. Dear Hendrik, dear colleagues, dear students, dear friends, dear members of uh, Roberta Buffett's uh, family, let me assure you that I feel very privileged uh, to have the honor to give this lecture that carries Roberta Buffett's name uh, today. And let me express my profound gratitude to the Roberta Buffett uh, Center for International and Comparative Studies for having given me the opportunity to be this term's Roberta Buffett visiting uh, uh, professor. Special thanks go to uh, Karen Alter who had the idea to invite me for uh, uh, the term. Let me assure you it's great to be in Evanston, it's great to be at Northwestern, 
and it's great to be at the Buffett Center and to be part of its very many thrilling uh, activities. Thank you very much indeed. The title of my lecture is International Organizations and Nation States, a Relationship in Transition. In fact, it seems obvious that this relationship has undergone some dramatic changes in the last two or three de decades. Who would have thought 20 years ago that the United Nations Security Council may decide on the freezing of bank accounts of terror suspects and war criminals? Who would have thought 20 years ago that a largely independent uh, judicial body of the World Trade Organization, the WTO, had the authority to decide on whether it is okay that Europeans ban uh, hormones treated beef and genetically modified fr food from their uh, markets? Who would have thought 20 years ago that most European Union member states would have a common currency and a common uh, independent European Central Bank? And who would have thought 20 years ago that an international criminal court could order the extradition of a president of a sovereign country such as Sudan? Of course, these examples of a transformation of international organizations' activities have not gone unnoticed. Yet, it has become a matter of debate how to interpret these uh, changes in the activities of international uh, organizations. So I just made all these examples about how the activities of international organizations have changed over uh, time, and I said that uh, these examples have not gone on unnoticed, but that there is a debate how to interpret uh, them. And internationalists argue that these examples underline that international organizations are becoming independent sites of authority. They are becoming actors that may act independent of states and are thus hollowing out states' serenity. Statists, by contrast, hold that international organizations, remain, uh, in, international organizations remain what they have always been, namely fundamentally dependent and controlled by their member states. In this view, international organizations remain states' instruments without any impact on their sovereignty. In this lecture, I will argue that both positions are right and wrong at the same time. They rely on an inadequate, one-dimensional, zero-sum understanding of political authority, which leads into mock battles. Therefore, I unpack the notion of political authority and distinguish three dimensions, decision-making authority, operational capacity, and legitimizing power. By doing so, one can firstly see that international organizations are mainly gaining independent decision-making authority. This is what internationalists focus on and what statists tend to ignore. By distinguishing these authority dimensions, one can secondly see that international organizations remain fundamentally dependent on states' operational capacities. This is what statists focus on and internationalists tend to ignore. Finally, the distinction allows one to notice that a relationship of mutual dependence seems to be emerging with regard to international organizations and states' respective legitimacy. This is often overlooked by internationalists and statists alike. To lend support to these claims, I will trace in what follows how the authority relations of international organizations and nation states have evolved over time. However, one caveat uh, seems to be in order first. What follows is not an academic discussion in the sense of presenting results of original research. It is rather the attempt to bring together published research done by myself and done by others in order to come up with an interpretation, original I hope, uh, of how the authority relations between international organizations and nation states have changed over time. This historical interpretation based on stylized facts is captured by four core propositions which will structure my uh, talk. Let me immediately jump to the first uh, proposition. It claims that the rise of international organizations in uh, the late 19th and during major parts of, 20, of the 20th century did not undermine states' political authority. To the contrary, largely controlled by their member states, international organizations functioned as a shield to protect 
state's governance authority. They merely engaged in intergovernmental governance. To be sure, after the first international organizations such as the Rhine River Commission or the Universal Postal Union emerged in the mid-19th century, international organizations became more and more important. Due to increasing cross-border complex interdependencies resulting from the Industrial uh, Revolution, states created international organizations to manage these interdependencies in a favorable way. The number of international organizations rose from 25 in the late 19th century to about 100 in the mid 20th century and reached a peak of 350 in the late 20th century. The number of issues covered by international organizations grew too. The first international organizations in the 19th century dealt with very, very limited technical issues such as the coordination of standards in international mailing, in international shipping, and in international railway transportation. In the 20th century, by contrast, international organizations such as the United Nations, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, and the International Labour Organization cover a great variety of political issues from preserving international peace to stabilizing the global economy and improving social welfare. Yet, up until the 1980s, I would say, the function of these international organizations was not to intervene into states' political authority. To the contrary, states created many international organizations as a shield to increase their own governance capacities. As a consequence, international organizations were mainly concerned with norms for interstate conduct, so-called at-the-border norms. Take the United Nations uh, as founded in 1945 as an example. The most important United Nations norms in the security realm, such as the ban on the use of force, referred to states at the border security and were thus regulating interstate conduct. Thus, you, the United Nations was designed to enhance states at the border security, while at the same time, each state's right to self-defense, also at the border, was uh, confirmed and the UN was explicitly banned from intervening in states' domestic affairs. Or take the general agreement on tariffs and uh, trade of 1947. The most important GATT norms referred to at the border trade barriers, such as tariffs and were thus regulating, again, interstate conduct. And as such, these norms referred, uh, uh, reflected the principles of embedded liberalism according to which international trade should be as free as possible while at the same time allowing states to keep at the border trade barriers necessary to build up independently of each other social welfare state systems and to engage in independently of each other in Keynesian welfare uh, uh, economic uh, steering. Apart from being limited to the function of shielding states' governance authority, up until the 1980s, international organizations were also largely controlled by states. Their decision-making authority was very limited. In almost all international organizations, almost all decisions required the consent of almost all member states almost all uh, the time, one could say. Take the GATT again as an example. Decisions about new, new norms, EA, the reduction of trade barriers, could only be made in intergovernmental negotiations and thus by consensus. And even decisions criticizing states that had violated agreed GATT norms could only be taken by consensus. States that were affected by such a violation could invoke a dispute settlement a panel of GATT, but the panel establishment, the selection of panelists, and the approval of panel reports required a consensual decision in the GATT Council. Thus, even the norm-violating state himself could control the decision-making at each stage of the process. Or take again the United Nations. New norms, for instance, concerning the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons could only, be, could only become binding when intergovernmental negotiations led to a consensus among the relevant 
uh, states. The consensus requirement extended even to the norm application by the Security Council. Formally, council decisions could be made by qualified majority, sure. But in reality, and under the conditions of the Cold War, near consensus was almost always required. Even in case of a violation of the ban on the use of force, offending states hardly ran the risk of a Security Council resolution criticizing it. Moreover, states not only controlled the decisions of international organizations, but also controlled the operational capacities needed for implementing them. GATT is an extreme example in this respect. While other international organizations had at least some administrative and financial resources, uh, it took GATT until the 1970s to get its own secretariat. But even then, it did clearly not have the operational capacities, resources, to implement its decisions. If, for instance, states violated dispute settlement panel reports, GATT could only authorize the affected states to retaliate. It could not sanction itself the norm-violating state. The same applies to the United Nations, of course. Sure, the United Nations had a secretariat and some financial resources, but as the UN military forces foreseen in the UN Charter never came into being, it was not able and still is not able to implement decisions about, for instance, peacekeeping, let alone uh, peace enforcement uh, uh, missions. It had and it still has to rely on states that are willing to provide on a case-by-case -case basis uh, uh, troops that are necessary for these uh, missions. States not only controlled international organizations' decisions and their operational capacities, but also their legitimacy. The sovereignty-based legitimacy discourse of the time was that international organizations are controlled by states which thereby legitimate, uh, uh, give thereby legitimacy to uh, international organizations' governance uh, activities. Thus, the legitimacy of international organizations fully depended on each state's active uh, consent. To be sure, this is by no means to say that international organizations were not important. They were very important. Yet they were given a very specific function of shielding states' domestic authority while at the same time being largely controlled by states. States were clearly the only chief in town. Now, my second proposition is that towards the end of the 20th century and at the beginning of the 21st century, international organizations are becoming independent sites of governance authority. Less and less controlled by states, they increasingly intervene into what used to be states' domestic affairs. Their governance activities become supranational. Due to globalization, not only in the economic field, but also in other fields like security, environment, communication, uh, international organizations was increasingly given the authority of setting behind the border norms and promoting compliance with them. As opposed to at the border norms, behind the border norms are not directed as sta at states as ultimate targets, but at non-state <coughs> private actors be they ordinary citizens, private businesses, military commanders, suspected terrorists, or ethnic minorities. They go beyond managing the interface between uh, states. The UN is no longer only concerned with interstate use of military force, but concerns itself with non-state actors' use of military force in intrastate conflicts. The UN Security Council intervened in a variety of intrastate uh, conflicts uh, ranging from Somalia and Haiti to Bosnia and Cambodia. And in many of these conflicts, the UN Security Council targeted not only state actors, but private groups or individuals too. It mandated, for instance, the freezing of bank accounts of political leaders and military commanders that it deemed responsible for the use of excessive military force uh, uh, against civilians. By the same token, GATT is no longer mainly concerned with at-the-border trade barriers, such as tariffs. Its successor, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, has its focus on behind-the-border non-tariff uh, 
barriers to trade, such as technical standards or food safety standards. This shift from shielding states to intervening into states' domestic affairs and the resulting shift towards non-state actors as ultimate targets is accompanied by states giving up some of their control of international organizations. International organizations gained especially in decision-making authority. States are less and less able to single-handedly uh, control uh, their decisions. An increasing number of international institutions is now uh, able to make majority decisions. One example is the UN Security Council, which nowadays makes majority decisions which are no longer only concerned with applying UN norms. It also sets completely new norms, such as that states have to persecute under domestic uh, uh, criminal law the proliferation of nuclear weapons, relevant material to non-state uh, actors. This is the famous resolution 1540 of 2004. Moreover, an increasing number of international organizations is nowadays given the authority to make decisions in supranational uh, bodies. This rarely, if ever, extends to norm-setting decisions, but it concerns decisions through which international norms are applied to specific cases. The appellate body of the WTO, the World Trade Court, if you will, created in 1995, or the International Criminal Court, created in 2001, can be cited as prominent examples. Both are independent courts that make decisions based on international law. Yet, while international organizations have gained supranational decision-making powers, they hardly manage to increase their operational capacities to implement these uh, decisions. The UN is able to condemn terrorism. It can require states to go after terror suspects and to freeze their bank accounts, but it cannot go, go after the terrorists or freeze their bank accounts itself. It has to rely on states to do so. The WTO is able to require states to persecute copyright infringements, but it cannot itself investigate copyright infringements, confiscate products, or collect fines. As it does not have the operational cap capacities to do, to do so, it has to rely on states in this respect. What about the legitimacy of international organizations? First of all, there clearly is a growing demand for international organizations to legitimize their governance activities. The traditional sovereignty-based legitimization, this is very difficult for Germans, legitimization uh, uh, discourse can no longer stick because international organizations are no longer addressing only states and they are no longer fully controlled by states. As their governance activities become more supranational, international organizations have increasingly come under political fire. Just think of the public protests during IMF, WTO, G7, G20, G20 meetings in the 1990s and 2000s. To cope with their perceived legitimacy deficit, almost all international organizations have uh, begun uh, to include uh, non-state actors in their uh, decision making. They try to enhance their legitimacy and to tap into sources of legitimacy that are independent from states. They tried and still try to give themselves a more democratic flavor, if you will, by opening up for civil society participation. Non-governmental organizations are increasingly invited to participate in their activities. Just think of UN environmental and human rights conferences that are flooded with NGOs that not only participate as observers, uh, but may also make their positions heard in the official conference rooms. Today, even the WTO and the UN Security Council, which were certainly not forerunners in this respect, have opened up for civil society uh, participation. This opening up towards civil society furthers public deliberations about the policies of international organizations and thus gives these organizations uh, an independent source of uh, legitimacy. 
Overall, international organizations have been given a new function. Rather than shielding states' domestic governance, they intervene in states' domestic affairs while at the same time no longer being fully controlled by states. States remain important, but they are clearly no longer the only chief in town. This brings me to my third uh, proposition. It claims that since the early 21st century, international organizations are increasingly trying to circumvent states by involving private actors in their governance activities. They engage in transnational governance that directly works at private targets. International organizations have begun uh, to go beyond setting and promoting behind the border norms. They no longer rely only on norms that require states to set and enforce norms for non-state targets. They rather set the norms for non-state targets uh, themselves. They thus engage in setting and promoting beyond the border norms. Take the International Criminal Court. Its status does not only address states to make, for instance, genocide a domestic criminal offense. It directly makes it a criminal offense on the global level and thus speaks directly to individual perpetrators, not through its member states. This shift from behind the border norms addressing states to beyond the border norms addressing private actors makes governance for international organizations a much more difficult task. Yet only few international organizations gained supranational governance authority. They can rarely act with hard governance tools, binding enforceable law, directly on their private targets. This is the reason why we barely ever make direct contact with international organizations. We receive no letters, no telephone calls, no fines, no emails, no bills, nothing of the sort uh, from international uh, uh, organizations. One of the very few examples of an international organization uh, uh, being able to use hard instruments directly towards private targets is the International uh, Criminal Court, which can prosecute individuals that have committed uh, war uh, crimes. But this is the exception. As they rarely have these supranational competencies, most international organizations have to rely on transnational governance tools to set beyond the border norms and promote compliance with these beyond the border norms. They join forces with uh, civil society actors by involving them in their governance activities, thereby getting access to their private uh, targets without any state uh, involvement. Depending on whether international uh, organizations use hard or soft instruments and whether they work directly uh, uh, on their governance ta targets or indirectly through civil society actors, four modes of governance can be uh, distinguished. Using persuasion as a governance mode, some international organizations have begun to systematically promote private actors' voluntary uh, self-regulation. As they rarely can use binding law to affect their targets, they rely on soft, non-binding instruments. They try to persuade their targets to accept international norms voluntarily. The UN Global, the U, the UN Global Compact is a prominent example here. The UN asks private businesses to accept voluntarily the social standards as laid down in the UN Global uh, Compact. By listing cooperating companies on its website, the UN promotes corporate social responsibility without being able to enforce uh, the respective norms. Another way in which international organizations try to address their private uh, targets without using states as a link is to delegate governance uh, 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 tasks to non-state actors. Here, international organizations engage, engage only indirectly with their targets because non-state agents accountable to the organization are brought in to fulfill governance tasks. The international organization itself is unwilling or unable to perform. 
the UN delegating the construction of refugee camps to aid agency may serve as an example, uh, as does the World Bank when it supports educational projects of NGOs in developing uh, countries. Still another way of how international organizations address their private targets without relying on states is what can be called orchestration. Orchestration is indirect as is delegation, while at the same time being soft as is uh, persuasion. Orchestration is indirect because third parties are brought in as intermediaries, yet it is soft because intermediaries are not really controlled by the organization, but rather only supported. International organizations use orchestration techniques to set up so-called public-private or private-private uh, partnerships. For example, the United Nations helped private businesses and civil society actors to set up the so-called Kimberley Process Certification Scheme to certify diamonds according to their uh, uh, origin and thus to distinguish ordinary diamonds from so-called blood diamonds which helped warring parties, for instance, in Sierra Leone to, fina to finance their war effort. International organizations use orchestration also to establish so-called transgovernmental uh, networks. Using their convening power, international organizations bring together bureaucrats and experts from member states to make informal decisions which are not really controlled by the political organs of the organization or the political leadership of its uh, member states. One example is the so-called Codex Alimentarius Commission, which elaborates international food safety uh, standards. As these examples may indicate, involving private actors in their transnational governance activities allows international organizations to exercise authority without having to rely on states. They join forces with non-state actors in order to work on the private targets uh, uh, independently of states. Overall, we see the following uh, uh, developments. The functions of international organizations have changed. They no longer merely shield states domestic authority based on at the border norms targeted at states. Using behind the border and beyond the border norms, they increasingly intervene in states' domestic affairs with private actors as their ultimate or even their immediate uh, targets. And this shift goes along with decreasing state control. International organizations are no longer only engaging in intergovernmental governance, they are increasingly engaged in much less state-controlled supranational and transnational governance activities uh, too. Now, considering these seemingly remarkable developments, one may think that international organizations are becoming truly independent uh, from states. Yet, my fourth and thus final proposition claims this not to be the case. The fact that international organizations are no longer fully controlled by states does by no, by, does by no means uh, imply that they are independent of states. There are three fundamental limitations that will keep international organizations dependent of states, not only in the short, but also in the long run. First, the perhaps most important limitation of international organizations uh, authority concerns their operational capacities. As they have hardly gained additional operational capacities, resources, international organizations remain fundamentally dependent on states in this respect. This is particularly true when it comes to enforcing decision, decisions against unwilling uh, targets. To be sure, enforcement is not always required to ensure compliance with international decisions. In fact, international decisions are generally respected despite the fact that they are hard to enforce. Yet, if enforcement is required, international organizations have no choice but to rely on state support because the relevant operational capacities remain a state's prerogative. 
It is thus states that enforce the freezing of bank accounts of terror suspects that are listed by the United Nations. And it is states, and it will remain states, that persecute copyright infringements the WTO is advocating against. Moreover, and perhaps even more important, since enforcing behind the border and beyond the border norms is much more difficult for international organizations than it ever was with regard to at the border norms, where only states were the targets, one may even argue that their dependence on states' operational capacities has in fact increased rather than decreased. The second limitation of international organizations' autonomy relates to their decision-making authority. International organizations have become remarkably independent from states with regard to their decision-making. Yet, due to the heterogeneity of states' domestic, political, legal, social, and cultural conditions, the uniform application of behind the border and beyond the border norms is much, much more difficult than it has ever been with regard to at the border norms. The ban on the use of force or the ban on import quotas can equally apply to Sweden and Sudan. Applying the same copyright regulations in both countries is by contrast almost impossible. Therefore, many decisions about behind the border and beyond the border norms have to be quite general, so as to be applicable under the diverging domestic circumstances in different states. This means, however, that they have to be further specified, a task international organizations uh, rarely, are rarely able to take on themselves. One may even claim that international organizations increasingly have to leave it to states to specify their decisions. The UN Security Council may commit states to criminalize uh, terrorist activities, but has to leave it to each individual state's discretion to define this duty for its specific social, political, cultural, and legal context. And the WTO may require the protection of copyrights uh, but must leave it to, to each state how this requirement is specified for the context of its society. The third limitation of the authority of international organizations concerns their uh, legitimization powers. Given that behind the border and beyond the border norms, as opposed to at the border norms, have non-state actors as targets, international organizations' legitimacy remains precarious. To be sure, their opening up towards civil society may further public deliberations about their policies and thus satisfy some principles of deliberative uh, legitimacy or deliberative democracy. Yet the way in which civil society participation is organized does not remotely match principles of democratic uh, legitimacy. International organizations select themselves the civil society actors they, uh, that may participate, and mostly they grant them merely observer status. Think about it. This is as if the American president could handpick members of Congress to his own liking, while at the same time granting Congress only the right to publicly give some advice on the bills that are passed by the president himself. This is, of course, not very democratic. The democratic legitimacy of international organizations therefore continues to be fundamentally dependent on states' active consent to international organizations' activities. And this dependence cannot be overcome by simply changing the institutional design features of international organizations. As the example of the European Union shows, international organizations do not become automatically democratic by having a directly elected parliament with legislative uh, powers. The social preconditions for de democracy, such as uh, a transnational collective identities, transnational civil society and transnational public sphere are hardly uh, developed to a degree that would allow democratic institutions to function properly on the international level. To be sure, this is not to say that the political authority of international organizations is not legitimate. I simply argue that international organizations are not able 
to develop their own democratic legitimacy any time soon. Thus, whether their authority is considered legitimate will continue to depend on whether states are willing to accept it. What is the upshot of all this and why is it important? The upshot is that we are witnessing a fundamental transformation of today's global authority structures. Internationalists got it right. The decision-making authority is increasingly located on the international level. Contrary to what statists claim, international organizations are no longer fully controlled uh, by states in this respect. Yet statists are correct with their claim that the operational capacities for the coercive implementation of international decisions rest on the nation state uh, level. Contrary to what internationalists often imply, in this respect international organizations continue to depend on nation states. And both internationalists and statists alike seem to overlook that international organizations and nation states depend on each other with regard to their legitimacy. We are thus heading towards a multi-level governance system in which none of the layers is independent of the other. International organizations are not able to act independent of states, but states are also no longer able to control international uh, organizations' activities and to uh, uh, be completely independent of their decisions. Why is that important? In my view, this is important because discussions about the future role of international organizations and their relationship with nation states are often hindered by a distorted understanding of international organizations' authority. This is true for the mock battles between internationalists and statists, but this is also true for the public debates between supporters of international organizations, many of which can be found in Europe and their critics often to be found here in the US. Both European supporters and American critics tend to ignore the fundamental limitations of international organizations' authority. In the case of European supporters, this leads due to extremely high expectations to delusions, and in the case of American critics, this leads, due to exaggerations, to dramatizations. Both dramatizations and delusions are not what we need. What we need is an adequate understanding of international organizations, what they can do, what they cannot, cannot be doing, uh, what they are doing and can be doing, and an adequate understanding of what they are not doing and cannot be doing. Only based on such an understanding, we will be able to construct successfully the world order that is needed to manage the coming trans transition from a unipolar to a multipolar world. I would be more than happy if my thoughts contributed to such an understanding on both the European and the American side of the Atlantic. Thank you very much. Very good on time, pretty precise as, as always. Thank you, Bernard. <laughs> so we've got about 10, 15 minutes for questions. Um, we'll see how far we go, but uh, I'll stop no later than quarter past five. But uh, I think we've got a few minutes to ask Bernard some uh, queries. So the floor is open. I think Bernard will direct traffic himself. Questions, Karen. Yeah, actually, I, I, I thought about whether I should include a paragraph on, on, on that, on that uh, issue. Uh, and I kicked it out due to time restrictions and also because I thought that is well known, the whole story that uh, today's issues we are dealing with are mainly global, global issues, climate change and stuff. 
uh, stuff like that. And it's, it's very clear that these kind of issues, if, if climate change is out there, I mean, we, we do not really know, but uh, let's assume that there is climate change and it is uh, man-made, uh, then it is a problem we have to deal with and there is not a single government on earth that is able to deal uh, with uh, that problem. Only by uh, uh, working together on the international level, states will be able to solve uh, uh, this problem if it, is, uh, if, it is, uh, uh, if it can be solved. Uh, uh, at all. And as we have more and more of these global problems, we have more and more issue uh, areas in which states can barely act alone in order to solve these problems uh, uh, adequately. And that drives them towards uh, international uh, organizations as instruments to, uh, to solve uh, these, uh, these uh, problems. And that also drives them to give international organizations uh, uh, the authority not only to, to deal with matters that uh, uh, concern interstate conduct, but to deal with matters that uh, uh, deal with what private actors are doing. Because for climate change, ultimately, it's not states that are responsible, but we in our daily lives are responsible for, uh, uh, for uh, for climate change. So if international organizations want to deal with this problem, they cannot only address uh, states, but ultimately they have to address uh, private actors' uh, 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 behavior. Brian. Yeah, I, I want to pick up on, on that and tie that into the end of your presentation where you talked about essentially this is a framework for reconciling European and American attitudes about international organizations and set of expectations. And your story is a story of when the United States and Europe, uh, to varying degrees, um, set the agenda internationally. Today, we've got new states that have very different thoughts about what appropriate solutions are to these problems. Is it, I guess the, the, the provocative way to say this, is this crystallizing an understanding of the world just at the moment it's about to change. As China comes up, they're not interested in these consensus answers, which yes, have been carefully developed between the international and domestic state levels, but they're interested in very different types of answers. So do you see this becoming destabilized, or what direction are we going? I mean, it's, it's certainly true that China is very much in favor of international organizations as long as we are in the, in, in, in the first row here. And the more we are moving downwards, uh, the less uh, it is in, enthusiastic about international uh, organizations. That's certainly uh, true. At the same time, uh, China is also uh, feeling global, cha uh, global climate change if it, is, if it is out there. So one would expect that Ch also China might be moving towards uh, the, lower, the lower rows, driven by, uh, uh, and globalization would be the engine of this kind of uh, changing uh, belief set or changing uh, mindset in, in, in China. I'm very much convinced that China will move down, uh, down uh, from, 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 from this from this row to the, to the second and the third row and will go along with international organizations having uh, the authority to intervene in domestic uh, affairs. That might not necessarily imply intervening when it comes to, to, to human rights issues, but that might uh, certainly imply issues like, like climate change. Or also, it, and also when it comes to all these trade uh, issues like technical, uh, uh, technical barriers to to trade food safety standards and, 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 and issues like that. I, I think when we, when we talk about these issues, China is already moving, moving uh, uh, down from the first to the, second, uh, to the second row. So far, it's certainly not in the third row. That's, that's certainly true. But I mean, one could even say that all the more it is important that uh, if, if North America and Western Europe is interested in having international organizations that are able to engage in, glo in, in, in steering uh, global affairs through beyond the border norms, it makes a whole lot of sense to make that move now so that when China uh, uh, becomes the dominant power that it is socialized into uh, international organizations that are doing these things uh, uh, already. Yes? 
target, yeah. I mean, what, what two two answers, per, perhaps. Uh, one is, I mean, I, I I'm I'm not excluding the possibilities that private actors become important also as governance uh, actors and not just as targets of international uh, organizations' governance activities. And that's what I try to make to to make very clear here, because international organizations are using private actors in order to address other private actors. That's, when I, that's what I uh, uh, referred to when I spoke about delegation, orchestration, partly also uh, uh, persuasion. Here international organizations try to get direct link to private uh, actors. I mean the, 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 the example you are, you are making is more uh, one that is located uh, uh, on, on this level, where private actors work with international organizations to, uh, uh, to force states to accept uh, uh, the, the, the behind the border norms that were, that were uh, set on the, international, on the international level. And of course, it's very important here. I mean, the European, uh, uh, the, the, the European project was only possible to, or was possible to a large uh, degree because private actors could use the European Court of Justice in order to, uh, to make their, uh, their governments comply with uh, European, uh, European uh, law. Karen Alter wrote a fantastic book about the topic, so. <laughs> Anything else, yeah? Yeah, I mean, of course, NGOs are doing very many things uh, without being told to do them, uh, in, especially in, 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 in the developing world. Nevertheless, in very many of these areas in which NGOs are, are uh, engaging in, in these activities, uh, some coordination is necessary. Uh, so that not everybody does the same at the same time, but that there is some division of labor between uh, 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 between um, NGOs or some collaboration between NGOs with different uh, uh, capabilities and uh, different uh, type of uh, knowledge. And that's where orchestration is extremely important. International organizations can sort of help NGOs to do what they are uh, doing by coordinating uh, uh, their activities. When it comes, for instance, to disaster relief, uh, Haiti or so, it, the organization that is that is, or the organizations that are running the show are NGOs, but the organization that is coordinating the show is most of the time the United Nations. They have the capacities to, to, to coordinate the activities of, of different NGOs. And I think orchestration is exactly the, the, the field which is very promising for the future and which will become more and more important uh, 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 in the future. So this is a soft way of, of, of governing because you do not really use uh, binding enforceable uh, uh, law as an international organization. You try, you, you, ra you rather try to help uh, those actors who are already in the business of doing good things uh, uh, in terms of of, of of governance. More question, well, Henrik. Let me close one. I wonder if you go back to the slide. Is it P four with the sequential? P4. That one. That, oh, sorry, that one. That, that one? That, that one, exactly. 
So this is a very simple story. We're talking about them whether science functionalist arguments mostly. But you, you move from one sphere into the next, things start to uh, cooperate in one sphere, the things get more complicated, so we have to branch out, the more interactions create international organizations. And in your answer to Karen, you said, well, globalization, uh, we have global warming, so we're going to need more uh, authority for international organizations. So it's a very clearly a logical story that things are going towards the international organizations getting more authority. Sooner or later, that's the future, okay? Despite the Chinese of the world, and you said to Brian's question, that's exactly where China's going to go, we're all going to end up here in the bottom row. So if, if it is a theological story driven by functional issues, why is North America so different from Europe? My contention is this is the European story, this is the EU. But why does NAFTA look so different from the North American region, which should, according to your functionalist argument, look pretty much like the EU? And yet, we've seen very little integration in NAFTA. The US is very defensive about getting involved. Mexico will not go there. Certainly not on energy issues. So, uh, if your story holds, shouldn't North America look more like Europe than it does? I mean, if the question is why is, is, is Europe uh, so different from, from, from the US and why is Europe much more willing to go down this road than, than, than the US, I would have two answers. The one is power and the, the other one is uh, uh, less being exposed to, uh, to, to globalization. The US is much more powerful and I mean you could, you could on, on, on the same level of economic development, you could, you could I guess, I'm, I didn't do that, but I'm pretty sure you could show that uh, the more powerful a country is, the more it, it, would, it, it would like uh, to have international organizations up here rather than going here. And the, more, the, 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 the less powerful a country is, the, the more we will go down, uh, we will get, we will go down uh, the ladder here. So that would be one of the explanations why the U.S. is comparatively uh, 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 much up here while Europe is more, more down. The, the other one is that uh, uh, very many forces which are uh, connected to globalization are much less strong here in the US than in, in most European uh, countries. I mean, just look at uh, foreign trade. I mean, Germany has a foreign trade ratio of about 50%. The US has a foreign uh, trade ratio of about uh, 20%. That exposes uh, uh, Germany to a much higher degree to forces of globalization and issues of globalization than the US is uh, exposed to these uh, forces. And that makes Germany much more dependent on a functioning international uh, system with a lot of authority for international organizations than, uh, than, than the US. And the difference between China and the US uh, uh, is the level of economic development. That's why China is still more up here than, uh, uh, than, than the US. And yes, it is to a large degree a functional story that I'm, that I'm uh, uh, telling here. Any further All right. questions? Please join me. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you. 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 Thank you.